Welcome to this edition of CBN News Weekend. I'm Charlene Aaron. The Obama administration is giving Planned Parenthood a million dollars in grants through Obamacare. It comes even as Congress prepares to investigate the growing scandal of harvesting and selling baby body parts at Planned Parenthood clinics. Another video from the Center for Medical Progress showed yet even more horrific descriptions of the scenes taking place in Planned Parenthood clinics where aborted babies are harvested and sold for medical research. I literally have had um, women come in and they'll go to the OR and they're back out in three minutes. And I'm going, what's going on? Oh yeah, the fetus was already in the vaginal canal whenever the, we put her wow. in the syrup, it just fell out. Well, meanwhile, a new study by the Media Research Center shows network news cares more about pandas than aborted babies. In a three-week period in August, ABC, NBC, and CBS News spent 29 minutes talking about the pandas born at the National Zoo that month. They spent only 24 minutes on the Planned Parenthood scandal in the seven weeks after the story broke. Anchors even called pandas before birth babies, but call unborn humans fetal tissue. In response to the congressional investigations, Planned Parenthood has written a letter to Congress defending their practice of selling aborted baby body parts. The nation's biggest abortion provider claims in the letter that they obey all laws, but they also admit they are, quote, proud to have a role in fetal tissue research. And the American Center for Law and Justice says that the letter exposes nine shocking practices at Planned Parenthood. For example, Planned Parenthood finally admits that abortion is a core service. They admit nearly 20 percent of affiliates, possibly 100 sites, have been involved in selling baby body parts over the last five years. They also claim that federal law requiring consent for fetal tissue donations is not applicable to them. Well, the fight to remove Margaret Sanger's controversial bust from the National Portrait Gallery is ongoing. A group of black pastors met in D.C. to protest the statue, and they say to educate America on the dark ideas that Sanger promoted. Abigail Robertson brings us that story. A group of black pastors and pro-life advocates gathered in front of the National Portrait Gallery to demand the removal of the bust of the late Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, and some critics say a racist. The controversial bust has been on display since 2010 in the museum's Struggle for Justice exhibit alongside figures like Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Those protesting the bust argue, how can a woman who advocated for the use of eugenics in blacks and minorities be on display with these civil rights heroes? When Bishop E.W. Jackson learned the bus was part of the exhibit, he assembled a group called Ministers Taking a Stand to fight for its removal. She began her career trying to reduce the populations of black and other minorities through eugenics, which meant forced or coerced sterilization. She referred to black people and others as inferior, people who should be banned from having children, and she also referred to them as human weeds and human waste. Pastor Iverson Jackson of Zoe Bible Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, urged the crowd in front of the gallery to join the fight against this hurtful symbol. This symbol, this portrait, this bust of Margaret Sanger is destroying this country because of its racist spirit. So we stand together here today to say Margaret Sanger's bust must go. Museum spokeswoman Bethany Bentley has said the statue will not be removed and that the gallery is meant to display significant people who represent the full spectrum of the American experience. Texas Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Louie Gohmert have also joined the fight and have drafted a letter to Congress urging their colleagues to support the cause. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. And so far, nearly 15,000 people have signed the petition calling for the removal of the statue. A federal judge has sided with a pro-life group in a lawsuit over the birth control mandate in Obamacare. The March for Life is a non-religious organization that exists to fight abortion. They hold an annual protest of the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision that allowed abortion nationwide. But that contraception mandate in Obamacare would have forced the March for Life to provide health coverage for abortion-inducing drugs, the very type of practice they oppose. Now a judge has ruled that the March for Life can be exempt from the mandate because of their ethical objections. 
The Environmental Protection Agency is going ahead with a new federal rule that says it will protect small streams, tributaries, and wetlands, despite a court order that blocked the measure in 13 central and western states. Opponents say they'll keep on fighting. Four senators, two Democrats and two Republicans, wrote an opinion column against the rule, saying the EPA has created considerable and potentially costly confusion for many American businesses and communities who are just trying to do their jobs well. The EPA says the rule simply clarifies which smaller waterways can be protected by the federal government. Opponents call the rule an example of federal overreach, and they fear more federal regulations of nearly every stream and ditch on rural lands. Well, the late Jack Kemp was a conservative Republican who dove into the inner city in the 1980s and 90s. He showed that conservative ideas and programs could actually help end poverty, not just pay trillions in welfare that maintains the status quo. As Paul Strand reports, some say Republicans need to champion these programs again to show what works to actually help the poor. Conservative ideas and values are conquering inner-city poverty, crime, and addictions at places like the House of Help, City of Hope project in one of D.C.'s poorest neighborhoods. Here, women and kids who were beaten and abused are healing, criminals are reforming, addicts are getting free. And it's all without the bloated bureaucratic programs many see as hindering more than helping folks break out of poverty. The problem with many of the big government programs meant to help the poor is that much of the money actually doesn't go to the poor. Bob Woodson, Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, supports conservative solutions rather than ineffective, wasteful welfare programs. We spend about $20 trillion on programs to aid the poor. Seventy cents of every one of those dollars goes not to the poor, but those who serve poor people. Critics say that's created a massive self-perpetuating bureaucracy some call the poverty industrial complex. Its only way to survive is maintaining a huge poor population dependent on government. So uh, poor people are being injured by the helping hand of government. House of Help, City of Hope's Bishop Shirley Holloway has spent decades, one by one, arming some of society's most hopeless people to become successful and productive. She says what they need is up-close love and relationship. The government uses systems. Systems don't work for people. Relationship does. And that's what we believe in, relationship. One with God one with yourself, and then one with others. Such a relationship turned around Donna Moore, who for years sold herself in the back of a van so she could buy drugs she then took in the same van. I was living in abandoned buildings and abandoned vehicles. I was a prostitute, eating out of trash cans. I was just, my life was shipwrecked. Government programs didn't help her transform. I didn't get what I needed to stay sober. But Holloway's ministry gave her tools to beat her addictions. And not only was I given the tools, I was loved. Holloway's love, discipline, and teaching helped Georgia Williams escape years of selling and doing drugs while she was working right inside a federal government agency and becoming suicidal. If it hadn't been for Bishop in this place, I would be dead today. Holloway says many of the poor dislike Republicans, but also realize what Democrats offer is an eventual dead end. People are tired of Democrats. You know, you can't give away the whole house. And they're hungry, like she is, for work and effort to be rewarded. I believe if you work hard, you should be successful. I believe if you're lazy and you don't want to do nothing, you should still eat, but you should not reap the fruit of the land. Right now, we're giving stuff away, you know, and so people think I can just stay at home, make babies, or stay at home and do nothing, and they'll take care of me. Arthur Brooks celebrates in his book, The Conservative Heart, real and lasting solutions to poverty that have already proved wildly successful. Since 1970, the percentage of the world's population living on a dollar a day or less, starvation level, has decreased by 80 percent. He says the Republicans need to support whatever will give poor people the dignity of work and self-sufficiency. And we have to design policies that don't maintain people in poverty and keep them at the edge, basically, of subsistence, but gives them an authentic opportunity to build their lives through work. We've done it before with welfare reform. We've weakened those reforms during the Obama administration. It's time to bring them back, and it's time for Republican politicians to be the true warriors for the poor that the poor deserve and that our hearts demand. What these advocates say is that if you give people a real hand up out of poverty, give them their freedom and their dignity, what you may get is their vote. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the House of Help, City of Hope, Washington. Thanks, Paul. And remember, you can get the latest from Paul by following him on Facebook and Twitter handle Paul Strand CBN.
A big success for a Christian movie in today's edition of Family Entertainment News, as the film War Room about the power of prayer had a strong box office opening at number two. The movie did better than expected, with an estimated $11 million in ticket sales opening weekend. The Sony TriStar release is the latest from Christian filmmakers, the Kendrick Brothers, who also produced Courageous and Fireproof. War Room is about a struggling family that is persevering through prayer. And its box office success came because many churches bought out entire theaters to attend and to send Hollywood a message about what they want to see. Up next, it's back to school time. We'll take you to the hottest club on campus, the Bible Club. See how one man is leading a revival across California's public schools. Well, it's back to school time across the country, but for thousands of students in public schools in California, that not only means back to class, but back to Bible clubs. And those clubs are growing across the Golden State and saving some teenagers from gangs, drugs, and even death. It's even being called a high school revival. Ephraim Graham brings us the story. California, best known for its sandy beaches, movie making, and Hollywood's rich and famous. Bad memories of when I was a kid. This man is praying for the Golden to State to be known for a great a revival. Brian Barcelona speaks at high school Bible club meetings, and students are paying attention, gangbangers included. And I'll never forget when I finished, there was this awkward pause in the room, you know, and this gangbanger stands to his feet, and he looks at me and says, what do I have to do to be saved? And I remember the principals pulled me into their, into their office, and he says, look, I don't know what you're saying in these meetings. I don't know what you're doing in these meetings, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it because gangs have been coming to our counseling offices saying we don't want to be a part of our gang no more, help us. Barcelona leads One Voice Student Missions, a ministry he started at his California high school. So literally, um, what One Voice does is we come alongside of the student and we say, what are your dreams? If money wasn't an issue, if time wasn't an issue, what would you believe for God to do in your school? <laughs> In six years, God has grown Brian's reach from one school to more than 20 and thousands of students. That is awesome. I was just like, man, this guy's legit. The biggest impact I would have was probably my attitude, because I used to either like let things get to me. I asked for him to pray for me, and like right there, I, I, I cried so much because I knew that I was doing so wrong. Hundreds attend Bible club meetings at Roosevelt High School, one of the only schools with a Planned Parenthood clinic on site. Free pizza draws some first timers. Come on in, come on in, pizza, throw sticks, it's gonna be funny. You're like, okay. But the message Brian preaches keeps them coming back. They encourage me to seek God more and to seek this deeper relationship. And I've really learned a lot and gained wisdom from their teachings. I love that they bring Jesus into my life because now I'm so much pos so much more positive the way I see things than before. And like, mm -hmm. it's just changed me so deeply. So I love Bible Club now. Little by little, coming to the Love Club, praying and, and worshiping, it's helped me like, it, it's helped me find myself. Bible club lessons at one school led students to take a trip to the beach to be baptized. Many people would say, and you hinted at this, how on earth is this happening in a public school? Well, every school is allowed clubs, whether it's a chess club, um, Islam club, Catholic club, math club. Uh, they're also allowed Bible clubs. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is it has to be student-led, student-led, student-led. Some school staff members embrace the clubs because they see improvement in their students' attitudes, behavior, and grades. Brian has seen even bigger changes. There was an anonymous letter left for, in the classroom that we were meeting in, and it, you know, to the Bible club president, to the guy who preached. You know, they didn't even know my name. It was a thank you letter. And it read something like, you know, um, yesterday night I was planning on killing myself, but during school I went to your meeting and I found hope and today I'm alive. You fearfully and wonderfully made. The letter hit home. It was also a youth group meeting 
that saved Brian's life when he was 16. Were you a Christian in high school? I was not until my senior year. Your senior year, what happened? So my senior year comes, I've been an, an atheist before that, did, did not believe in God, I've seen so much hypocrisy in the church. Uh, growing up, family used to go, then they stopped. So I just man, said, there's no way there could be a God. I moved with my mom and run into an old time friend uh, named Albert. And uh, he starts inviting me every week to the youth group. And finally one day he says, look, if you come to the youth group tonight, he says, I will buy you a Jamba Juice. And I says, well, man, free Jamba Juice. He said, what time are you going to pick me up? I remember I, I stood up in, in that church and I, and I says, Jesus, I don't know if you're real. I've heard you died on the cross. I've heard you've done these things. But if you're real, I dare you to touch me. And as soon as I said that, I felt this crazy love come over my body, and I just started weeping. The atheist became a believer, and God has used Brian to reach young people since that day. He says it's not because he's good, but because he's available. <laughs> and coming up, if you're wondering how did those gang members end up in a Bible school study anyway? Well, we'll get to hear from Ephraim Graham, and he'll tell us all about it when we come back. And with us now is our very own Ephraim Graham with more to this story. So Ephraim, help me to understand, the school actually wants this club to continue. They actually said, we want you to do more. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they've shown such favor for these club meetings? I think the bottom line is results, results. They have seen the work that this club is doing and all these clubs and One Voice Student Missions is doing, uh, and they like it. Number one, they've seen SAT scores go up. They've seen behavior in the classroom improve. They've seen uh, gang members leave gangs. They've seen the new life inside these students. As a result, they want to see this continue. And here's the thing, the one principal that was speaking with Brian Barcelona about continuing it is not even a Christian himself, but he likes the fruit of what's being done inside his school. So doors are open, continue it. Absolutely Beautiful. amazing. Now, I know many times as reporters, you know, we have a lot of things that happen with our stories. We, we have a lot of content, but we're not able to put it all in the final story. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of side stories that don't make it. I know it's happening with me and it's mm -hmm. happening with you too. Absolutely. Anything that you want to share that didn't make the final piece? Well, I'll tell you this. One of the things is how Brian received the call to begin this. Uh, we saw some of that in the story, but Brian was inside a, a, a convention, if you will, and literally God called him out in the middle of the convention, called him to the back of the room, and he could hear the voice of God say to him, I want to give you the nations and I want to do it through high schools. Those were God's exact words to Brian. Brian, at this time, he's thinking, you want to give me the nations? I can't even make my own bed. I mean, he's, he's barely a teen himself. Yeah, and, but he hears the voice of God saying that. Uh, that did not make the peace, but I got chills hearing that from him. Okay, chills that, hearing it now. You know, that God had called him to this and God is opening door after door after door for him. Awesome, awesome. Well, mentioning Brian, um, he did say in the story mm -hmm. that a gang member had given his life to Jesus Christ. How did this guy end up in a Bible club? I know. <laughs> it's a real funny story. Now, literally, here's the deal. The Bloods and the Crips are inside this high school. They're involved in a fight. Security and police come into the school to try and stop this. They are fleeing from police and security, and all they see is there's this one room open with something going on. So they go into the room and literally try to blend in with the crowd and, and sort of shrink, wow. if you will. And so they then get to hear the message that Brian is preaching inside this room, and one stands up and gives his life to Christ. Praise God, God is so funny and amazing at the <laughs> same time. Absolutely. Well, this is actually be, being called a high school revival. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. What do you think the club will face in the years ahead? Oh, I think growth, astronomical growth. I can already tell you that right now, Brian is at work expanding in Virginia as well as other states. They've got 20 schools in California. They plan to grow. There will be more growth for sure. Absolutely. Well, we root them on. Thank you for such a powerful story, Ephraim. Pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. 
It's time for some CBN good news. You were born with a purpose. That's from Ephesians 2.10, which says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, sometimes you might feel like your life is a mistake or an accident, but you were born with a purpose. The, the Almighty God from heaven and earth prepared just for you. So be encouraged. God has a good plan for your life. And that's going to do it for this hour of CBN News Weekend. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues that you care most about at CBNNews.com. And stay up to date with CBN News through Facebook and Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a wonderful weekend. God bless.